Hey, welcome back to Lunch Hour Live. I'm your host, Sue O'Connell. I don't know if you've heard, but there's an election coming up. We're just five days away from the 2020 presidential election. I think regardless of what point of view you have, you can agree that it has been stressful and rough and we're dying for it all to be over. But I'd like to take your mind off the election and explore some fun parts of the election cycle. Every single year, there's all sorts of tchotchkes and collectibles and memories that are made. Uh, and we've got some political items from both sides of the aisle. And guess what? Antiques Roadshow has a new election collection episode. It's from buttons to banners statues to seals and this episode showcases some fantastic finds related to american politics here's a quick taste of what you can expect to see next time on antiques roadshow we're capturing the collector demographic with a special episode dedicated to american politics the poster shows Grover Cleveland trying to win the fish of the presidency. These figures do show up from time to time that clearly depict uh -huh. who we know as Benjamin Franklin, but then this one says General Washington. Right. Tune into Antiques Roadshow Election Collection. It's given me joy just to look at it here today to give us a behind the scenes look at this episode. I'm joined by Antiques Roadshow executive producer, producer Marsha Bemko. Welcome back, Marsha. Great to see you. It's so good to be back, Sue. Thank you very much. And featured appraiser on Antiques Roadshow, Wes Cowan. Wes, welcome to Lunch Hour Live. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thank you. And I want to remind folks watching, if you have questions or comments, you could just put them in the comment section and we'll bring them to our guests. Marsha, I want to start with you. Of course, Roadshow has done lots of shows about political memorabilia, um, but you know we don't have to like beat it. But this has been a really tough election cycle, very unusual, uh, very stressful. Does this episode feel a little bit different this time around? You know, this episode, when you watch it, you won't be feeling the stress of the election cycle that we're in because we're looking back and we're looking at all the different kinds of political memorabilia that come to us. We've collected it all into one place. As we do with our theme shows, we've updated those prices so you can see what has happened. And we'll show you a, a, something that's coming up. But what we're talking about are things that have happened in our past that maybe we'll learn from too, but we're going, and this is Monday night, right before the election. So you can watch this right before you vote, if you're voting on Tuesday. Um, and that's the most important thing our elections ex special will remind you to do, that's to vote. But we have stuff that's some hundreds of years old in this election special, so a chance to look back. And Wes, Marsha points that out, but you know, we think of antiques, we think of it as being something 50 plus years old. But now items related to Barack Obama are being included in the show. At what point generally do you think an item becomes an antique or collectible? Uh, and what are some things that might um, escalate that definition for uh, someone who's collecting? Well, you know, let's, let's focus on political collectibles. Mm -hmm. um, I think first there's an organization called the American Political Items Collectors Association that has been around for a number of years and the members focus on political collectibles and, and they would tell you that the era of uh, campaign memorabilia really began in uh, 1840 with the campaign of William Henry Harrison and uh, it, it sort of goes forward from that. Um, the the, the hobby is really divided into two main camps. Those that collect buttons, and the earliest buttons date from the McKinley campaign uh, in the 1890s, and those who collect three-dimensional items. Uh, those are items that, uh, that typically are, are, were made before the era of the buttons. And political campaign buttons really dominate the hobby. So, you know, you, you pointed out a, a, an Obama uh, button to an APIC member, an American political items collector, that would be, you know, in, in their wheelhouse, not necessarily as an antique, but certainly a political collectible item. 
One of the things that I'm continually amazed about, Marsha, we talked about this last time you were on with us, is, you know, all of us, just regular folks, have stuff that uh, is either worthy of being in a museum and we know it or we don't know that it's worthy of being in a museum. I recently, uh, this week, cleaned out a storage facility and found a penny. And that was the one thing that I picked up and put in my pocket because it looked really old. And <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe it's bingo time for me. This could be the penny I've been looking for. I want to show a clip from uh, Antiques Roadshow Election Collection. This woman claims she owns the scarf that George Washington wore at his inauguration. Let's take a look. My mother said this was a scarf worn at George Washington's inauguration. When this showed up, I was so excited because, first of all, I love American folk art. Uh -huh. I also love American history. Right. This piece combines a great folk design right. with great history. So, as you know, President Washington was inaugurated on April 30th, 1789. A week later, they held a big ball down near Wall Street in New York for the president. All the ladies wore their finest. It was just something like this certainly would not be unusual at that. And up here, it looks like an abstract design. Somebody else actually pointed out, I can't take credit, this is G and this is a W. Oh, my George heart. Washington. That's fabulous. Isn't that great? You never No, it is never... better than fabulous. It's better than fabulous because the G, if you look sideways. I see the G. And, and then the, the W for George Washington. They're probably silver little spangles with glass beads. Right. Each one is carefully sewn over the star oh, for GW and the 13. That is so exciting. Isn't that neat? Oh, uh, and yeah. above it, the French, the, like the a fleur de lis. Now, a week after the major ball, yeah. Count de Moustier had another ball, the French Count de for Moustier. Washington. De Moustier. Now, we don't know, we certainly can't prove it, because these relics are so rare. And to my knowledge, no other of, of these banners exist, but it's po very possible that a banner like this would have been at that ball a week later. And I've checked with several experts here. The silk, the fine silk is of the period, the spangles, it's all right. The value on a, on a bad day would be $3,000 to $6,000. And this is the kind of object that in the right situation right. could bring $10,000, $15,000 at an auction setting. You want yeah. to really preserve as you've always done. I'm excited, really, Lee. I just love it. Marsha, what I love about that is it wasn't what she thought it was. She loved every part of it, regardless of what he was saying, and it ended up being something different, but just just so so important to her. Talk to me about um, which items you choose to feature on the show. What makes an item uh, worthy of showing on TV? Well, you know, most of what comes into Antiques Roadshow isn't worth showing on TV because most of us don't own things that are worth showing on TV. What we just saw, that 1789 sash, is incredibly rare. By the way, that is the oldest object in the show. There are things from the mid 1800s and on, but that is the oldest object. What I loved about that, and I, I don't remember, I'll be honest with you, if I picked that or one of the other producers picked it to be on the show, but you don't have to be a producer to know this is an amazing thing. This is the first time she saw the GW. And until we tip it like that, we don't see that. So some of it's easy decision making. That sash is an example of that. A lot of it isn't because you are presented with a lot of items that day. But generally, we want to teach you something. We're ultimately here to teach history through material culture. And, and we're not going to show you something you've seen lots of before, because we do see again and again some good Tiffany lamps. But if you've seen that Tiffany lamp, we're going to show you something else. Wes, we've got a, a question from someone in social media wondering where the average person can go to get a political item appraised. Well, you know, I, I would say that if they uh, if they posted a picture on the uh, APIC uh, Facebook wall, somebody will jump in for sure, and uh, they will uh, more than likely, uh, if it's valuable, they'll try to buy it from you. But, um, you know, the, uh, there are not a lot of appraisers uh, that are easy to find to appraise political uh, collectibles, but 
Uh, I, I think that if uh, a good place to start would be to um, to post a picture on social media on the uh, APSC Facebook wall and ask for help. That's that's a good place because there are, there are hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, that are looking at that. That's a good place to start. Wes, I want to stay with you and ask, you know, I don't think there's a, an appraising major in colleges, and I know that uh, each area of appraisal uh, requires its own unique set of, of uh, other information and knowledge and wisdom. How, how did you get into this field? Oh, boy. Uh, how many hours do we have? Um, I was always interested in, in collecting as a kid, and I collected all kinds of stuff, and uh, I became very interested when I was writing my uh, doctoral dissertation at the University of Michigan uh, in not writing my doctoral dissertation. So I started going to antique shops in southeastern Michigan and became very uh, enamored of old 19th century photographs. They were cheap and I could buy them and I thought that they were cool. And um, the 19th century photographs led me to meet a lot of other people that were collecting other things like political collectibles and autographs and manuscripts and books and you know um it um it just the rabbit hole that i went down uh was sort of a natural outgrowth of uh not wanting to write my doctoral dissertation i guess um you know in terms of how do you how do you get the experience i mean I don't have much dark hair in my face left, and uh, really, it's it's a matter of um, handling material over a number of years, visiting um, institutions, watching auctions. That that's how you that's how you get the knowledge. Let me Marshall, jump into let me just jump please. in to add to what Wes just said, and that is Wes is probably one of our few experts, and we work with a pool of about one hundred and fifty. Who has his doctorate in a, in a and came to the field that way? Most of our experts do not. And here's the thing: I've been making antiques roadshow for about twenty of its twenty-five years, and I could not be an appraiser. Really, learning to be uh, to really know what you're doing is what Wes has done for I don't know. He has a white hair. Go ahead, decades. Um, is uh, is a lot of looking, touching, and seeing, and and that's how you learn ultimately. You know, Marsha, yeah, last time we talked, we were talking about um, sort of the changes of what people were bringing in and sort of the era, you know, which we just talked about a moment ago when things suddenly become um, collectible or antique. And I'm wondering if you have um, just sort of general concerns about how electronic we all are now. I know on the show someone has a, a letter, right? And I, I know that any correspondence I might get these days might come by email and what do I do? I print out the email from a political candidate or a president and save it and try to bring it in 50 years from now. I mean, do you have any concerns about the phase or the, the era that we're entering for our current stuff and our current uh, collectibles and what they might be, be worth both, both, you know, financially, but also, you know, emotionally to us in the future? I'm nostalgic for the things that we won't have anymore. So back in the old days, and we've seen come into the show some very valuable drawings done by a costume designer. And I'm going to guess every costume designer now does not do it freehand. They're probably doing it on a computer. So there is no trail like that, except what we can't see now are the trails we're making. Most of those things that come into Roadshow weren't bought to be collected or kept or you know, some of them, yeah, great paintings were made, but they, it wasn't with that in mind. And they have their value has been demonstrated to us as we look back on them and they become valuable to us then. I mean, just think about it, people. Anybody like sort of in my generation, don't you wish you kept your Barbie doll? I mean, I wish I kept my Barbie doll. I wish I had put one aside in a box and it would be worth, Wes can tell us how much, I don't know if he knows that he doesn't do dolls, but he does own an auction. <laughs> They don't own an auction house. I think that Barbie doll is a five-figure doll. So I think it's, we don't know what this time will bring. And I certainly don't know, but I do know this. We will always be curious about what we own 
I don't know what's going to tickle our fancy. And Wes probably has his finger on the pulse as to what's, you know, how the market's changing, what's hot, nobody wants pottery, whatever it is. His finger's on the pulse there. But the real genius would be figuring out what that is, people, before everybody else does, buy it cheap and sell it high later. <laughs> well, as you know, everybody you know the, uh, <laughs> if, I, if I could just chip in there sure. um, and, and add to what both of you have said, uh, the demise of uh, handwriting, the demise of a typed letter uh, means that communication between all of us uh, ha has changed forever. Uh, I saw this coming uh, actually and lamented this when I was in graduate school. Um, the University of Michigan was one of the institutions that was um, on the, the quote-unquote internet very early on, and so there was email uh, even back in the, um, in the late 70s, early 80s. And, um, you know, it, it, just, it dawned on me then that as I was looking at reams of letters from scholars that passed back and forth in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s as I was doing my research, I, 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 was, I, I was lamenting that you know what? These are not going to be around <laughs> very soon. The only thing that's going to be around is an, is an email, and whether they will exist or not, you know, we don't know. Certainly the ones from the early days of the Internet are gone. Well, everybody likes to see if what they have has some value to it, not just average Joes. Every now and then a celebrity comes in looking to see if that item they have hanging in their basement is worth something. In this clip that I'm going to show you, former NFL player Alan Page learns that his parade banner from the Lincoln era is worth more than a couple of bucks. Let's take a look. It's not very often that I get to interview a real celebrity. Everybody knows who you are, Alan Page, former football great, Supreme Court Justice now, right, in, in Minnesota? Yes. This is a, a parade banner that was used after Lincoln was assassinated. Right. Uncle Abe, we will not forget you. From the smallest town to the biggest city, there were demonstrations, parades of mourning. What I find interesting is the parade torch at the top. Yes that this could have been used in a nighttime march. And to see this with this great shaft, and I mean, I love the shaft, the patina, the color. The feel of it is, it's got great feeling to it. To see this in this condition is really amazing. Now, in terms of political collectibles, the people who collect political items really like to have things that relate directly to the candidate being elected. If this was Let's Elect Abe, it would be in a whole different ballpark. The Lincoln morning items are a little bit step a step down in terms of value than the campaign items. This, on the other hand, is such a special thing with the original shaft, the, the torch, and the two-sided sign that that really elevates the status of this piece. If I were to put this in an auction of historical collectibles, I would think that this would be valued at somewhere between fifteen and twenty-five thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! There's Wes in action there, Marcia. I'm always shocked at how people are able to keep it together um, after learning that their item is worth tens of thousands of dollars. Um, in all your years of working on Roadshow and producing Roadshow, is there a reaction that has stood out to you the most? Yes, it, because it happened in our last tour. We, we didn't get to tour this year because of COVID. But in our tour last year, when we were in Fargo at Bonanzaville, I had waited my entire career for someone. People have cried and, and even appraisers have cried. Um, but I waited my entire life for someone to fall down after we say something. And that happened in Fargo. And yes, he got a stunning reveal as to what his, his watch was worth, his Rolex with all his paper that he hardly ever wore. It was like mint in box. Stunning. And yeah, that's my favorite reaction of all time, him going down. <laughs> what, what reaction, Marsha? I mean, what percentage of people do you think sell the item the next day after it has been appraised on uh, Antiques Roadshow? Is there uh, folks that run right out and sell it when it's been um, you know, appraised at such a high value? 
I know this and so do all of the experts we work with. It doesn't matter what it's worth. Most of the time, people do not sell their objects. It doesn't matter what it's worth. Very often the things we see that are valuable are inherited and they, and they don't wanna part with them. And whatever we say on the show, whether we say it's at auction, an insurance value, a retail value, there's a cost to you to sell it. So you're not gonna end up exactly with that amount of money. And then you sell it, you can't afford to buy it back if you can find it. So most of our people do not sell their objects. I think Wes could probably tell you, I don't know, probably has on one hand how many people he's heard from after decades of touring with Roadshow who wanted to sell something. Wes? Yeah, I, I, I would say I, I would agree with Marsha. I've been on this on the show for 23, 24 years. And the number of times that I have been called by a guest after the show and, and understand we're not allowed as appraisers to solicit business at all at the show. Uh, and we don't know the names or contact information of the people that we're appraising objects for. But if they call us after the show, then it's fair game. But in, in terms of the times that I've been called by a guest after the show, really very rare. It's more often that somebody, somebody contacts me and says, I saw you on the Antiques Roadshow and I have one that's just like what you sold and even then most of the time it's not just like what what i appraised but I it, it rarely, rarely do we ever get contacted i want to share with you some items that i have i've been um you know politically active since i was five and i collected emery boards with our revere massachusetts city councilor names on them luckily i no longer have them none of these are uh things that i think have monetary value they're all very important to me would never think about parting with them, but I have um, a letter from uh, Senator Edward Kennedy. And this is a letter that he sent to me and others after the Employment Non-Discrimination Act in um, 1996 was introduced into the Senate. It failed by a vote 49 to 50 because the Senator was ill and couldn't be on the floor. The Employment Non-Discrimination Act protecting gays and lesbians still doesn't exist. And along with this letter, uh, Senator Kennedy sent along the old-fashioned roll call, call vote, uh, roll call vote, with uh, a note at the top to sue. Um, I don't know what it says, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. So uh, the letter is, you know, very personalized, just talking about how we'll get it next year, but we didn't. <laughs> and um, it just means so much to have a senator thanking me for work that he was doing on behalf of my community. So. This is something that I love to have. On another front, I've got a um, Trump press pass. Uh, and this means a lot to me because it's February 4th, 2016. And I was uh, granted an interview with uh, President, uh, then candidate Trump, where he promised me that his administration would advance uh, LGBTQ rights at a, a very fast clip. He promised me that, and then that clip actually went on to be played in a robocall down in South Carolina, and it really put me on the map as a political commentator, so it has emotional feelings for me. This is something I think everybody has in their home. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> the great um, uh, Chadwick Miller, uh, 1965, I think, was it? Yep, 1965 presidential picture. I think it's worth $30 if you're lucky. Uh, I keep trying to get rid of it. I've been trying to get rid of it since 1965 and people keep moving it every time we move. It starts with Kennedy, it starts with Washington and ends with Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, I've got some stuff, uh, the lift the ban, Operation Lift the Ban dog tags from the human rights campaign. Uh, to try and uh, end the don't ask, don't tell ban on gays and lesbians in the military in 1994. And Wes, I want to just kind of segue over to buttons a little bit. This is a Clinton Gore button. It's an actual button from the campaign. I know when I was covering uh, the, the, the primary up in New Hampshire this year, I mean, the whole button game, <laughs> you know, the button business, uh, there's a mom and pop couple up there that do buttons any kind of button you could possibly imagine they make. If I were going to be a button collector, are there buttons that are more valuable to have? Is it better to have a campaign button than just a button that someone made? Uh, is, there, is there something to look for if that's something that you want to collect 
and try and make, you know, make it more monetary value from? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And first, let's talk about, as I mentioned earlier, that the buttons really, uh, the celluloid buttons really, uh, as a political collectible, uh, really began with the McKinley campaign. Collectors like to see uh, typically portraits of both the candidates on the, uh, both the vice president, the presidential and vice presidential candidate on the button uh, in the in the hobby that's called a jugat j-u-g-a-t-e so if you have a button um with with pictures of both uh, the v the president and the vp on that's better than just a single candidate button or a slogan button um, there are certainly some that are very very rare um, and, and uh, uh, again you know you can spend thousands of dollars tracking down a rare Juget button. Um, collectors also will tell you of celluloid buttons that if the celluloid button is yellowed, because it is plastic that's covering a picture, if that, if, if that celluloid is yellowed or it's cracked or it's stained, that that affects the value. So if you're collecting, look for great pristine condition ones um, you do have to be a little bit careful because some of the early buttons uh, uh, have been, uh, I, I don't want to say they're forged, but they are, uh, they've been replicated or duplicated. And so there are ones from the McKinley campaign and others uh, early, not early 20th century campaigns that actually were made in the 1960s. So right. it's, it's a little tricky, but you know, the thing about the button hobby is, uh, and, and again, that's where most campaign collectible uh, collectors are, are focusing. There, there's just thousands of them to collect, thousands upon thousands, and you can get into this hobby, particularly if you want to buy ones from the second half of the 20th century for a few dollars for, for each button. Marcia, look for the ones that have, look for ones that have uh, both names, both pictures. I want to play producer here for a minute because I'm Wes's producer normally. And um, if you had come into the show, Wes, if Sue had come into the show and she came in with that stuff, what happens at Antiques Roadshow is if you bring in something good, it's the appraised good. If you bring in something worth sharing with the nation, it's the experts like Wes who call uh, attention to the producer. What I want to know, just give us a little, little advance brushstroke. Is there anything that Sue showed you that you would pitch to us for television? Yeah, I would have picked the I would have pitched the uh, Kennedy letter and the roll call. You got something good. I think you need to tell her about that if you would have pitched it. Yeah, well, I you know I first when you first held up the letter, I th I thought to myself, gee, I wonder if that's a personal letter or if it's a letter that was simply sent out to thousands of people uh, who's were or hundreds who were his supporters and was not really autographed by Edward Kennedy. It was just signed with what we know in the business as an auto pen, or it was signed electronically with a with a with a fake pen with an electronic pen. Since you told me that it's a personalized letter, that's great. Um, to have the roll call personalize him to go with the letter adds a great deal of value to that, and particularly for that piece of legislation. So. Um, now let's talk about the, the, the downside of it is that if you're a collectible, if you're a political collector, uh, really the only kinds of political collectibles that are worth any real value are ones that were, uh, that have to do with a president. So, uh, even if that had been signed by Jack Kennedy as a congressman, uh, the letter would have been worth less than it would be if it were signed while he was a president. Since Teddy Kennedy never became president, the letter itself is probably worth a few hundred dollars and uh, with, the, with the roll call, maybe a, a couple hundred more. So it, it's, I, I would still tell you that the whole package is worth less than $500. Right, so, and, to your point, and to your point, Mark, you know, totally is it, the value of it to me is immeasurable. Uh, and I, 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 I thank you so much. Marsha, where can we watch Antiques Roadshow? 
Well, of course, you can watch us anytime, anywhere, online, many platforms there. But for this show, it gets released at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday night, this Monday night, coming up November 1. And you can see the entire election collection that we've collected up for you. And we have stuff to choose from. So the ones we put in the show are, are the ones we like a lot. So All right, Marsha and Wes, thank you so much for joining us at Lunch Hour Live. It's been such a pleasure talking to both of you. I hope to see you in the flesh soon. Thanks so much for joining us on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Sue O'Connell. I appreciate you spending time with us. Deep cleansing breaths. I'll see you next time. <laughs>